to read this morning from Psalms chapter number 36 and verses 5 through 9. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall, they, sh they shall be s abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. Let's pray. Father, we do praise you, and we thank you so much, Lord, for being that light for us. I just thank you, Lord, that many years ago you revealed that light to me, and I know that others here this morning are so grateful for that, Father. We all were so unworthy of it, but yet you are so merciful and kind and loving. Just pray this morning, Father, as we gather together that you'd speak through our pastor. Use him in a special way, Father, and thank you for him. Thank you for Clay and, Father, for our family that we have here. Thank you for the way that you grow us each and every day, Father. We love and praise you. May you be lifted up, and may you be praised in all that we do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, just one quick announcement this morning, <clears throat> that is the, uh, the celebration we're going to be having for Miss Tim and Deb tonight, immediately following evening, <clears throat> what? Did I say Miss Tim? <clears throat> I don't know why I say that, I... Miss Deb and Tim. Pastor Tim and Miss Deb. Praise the Lord. But we, we've been so glad to have you for 35 years, though. Really. It's taken me that long to memorize who you are. All right. Anyway, we're going to have a great time tonight. I think we're going to have some special speakers that are going to come and, and uh, share God's word and, and maybe a little past history with us. And that's going to be a lot of fun. You won't want to miss that. And uh, also afterwards, we're going to be having a refreshments back in the in the fellowship hall and uh, uh, if you haven't uh, got signed up for that or talked to Miss Sharon McCoy about what to bring for tonight I think she's probably got it all lined up already but uh, if you do want to bring something you might uh, talk to her about things that she might need last minute all right we always like to uh, welcome our first time visitors with us today and if this is your first time uh, here to worship with us we just ask that you might hold your hand up for just a moment so we can see you do we not have one? Not I knew you were a visitor, but I wasn't going to call out your name there. Good to have you with us this morning. I don't know if it's because she was with Luis and was just ashamed of it or what the deal was, but she didn't want to raise her hand. <laughs> Amen. Good to have you with us this morning. And uh, Clay? <laughs> Amen. I do want to just echo what Jeff said tonight. We will be having a fellowship afterwards, but... We've got some, uh, some preacher friends, um, Brother Ernest Best is coming, and, and uh, he's been a big influence in Dad's life. We've got um, 
you know, a questionable singing group. The Matthews family is going to be here. My si- my sister and her husband, and and uh, which really, Casey was only here not even half of the time. Dad's been pastoring, so I questioned whether to even invite her, but <laughs> felt like I felt like I had to do that. But uh, do come tonight. My mom has found about 200 pictures, and those will be running on a loop during our fellowship. And uh, I just looked back at a few of those, and there's some pictures of me that you wouldn't recognize if you've only been here the last 10 or 12 years. I have not aged well. (laughs) But you would uh, get a blessing out of of the the fellowship tonight. And I do just want to say how grateful I am uh, that, that God called dad to Lindsay Chapel 35 years ago. That was a blessing. And I say God, I would give credit to somebody else, but every other single human that was alive when he came is dead. (laughs) So uh, when he came, the group that was here, they're all gone. And so everybody here has come since then, I think, and that's uh, that's pretty amazing. But uh, we're going to sing page 411, our next congregational, Tis So Sweet, to trust in Jesus. I hope you're trusting in Jesus. And so let's sing out page 411. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word Just to rest upon his promise Just to know, thus saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood. Just in simple faith to plunge me Neath the healing, cleansing flood Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him How I've proved him o'er and o'er Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust him more Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus Just from sin and self to cease Just from Jesus simply taking Life and rest and joy and peace Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him How I proved him o'er and o'er Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that he is with me, will be with me to the Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Amen. Our last congregational hymn be page 54. Great is thy faithfulness. We won't be passing the plates still yet, but we do have some offering bowls at the back, so don't forget to give. We do have missionaries that we're still supporting and grateful that the church is able to give and do that. If you would stand as we sing, Great is thy faithfulness, page 54. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. 
Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Amen. You can be seated. Our youth choir will come at this time. They'll sing a special, Finish Well.
Amen. What a blessing. Uh, we love our young people and uh, continue to pray for them. I've often said if we would spend as much time praying for our young people as we do criticizing them, you might be surprised what God may give us. And I believe that we do pray for our young people and we are so very grateful um, for them. I was a young people when I came here. Um, <laughs> 35 years younger than I am today, and um, I'm going to preach to you, but I want to just take a few moments um, to reminisce just a little. I, I remember um, there were about three or four men in the church when I came here, and I'm talking about faithful men, and I remember them um, taking me out to the old Brandon Iron restaurant and uh, talking to me about the possibility of being their pastor. And I had, I wasn't even sure that I knew how to spell it back then. Uh, but I knew that God had called me to be one. And I was excited about that. What they failed to tell me, they told me a lot of things. Uh, matter of fact, I mentioned some of this Wednesday evening. They said, they said, Brother Tim, uh, if you might be interested in pastoring our church, there's a few things we want you to know. We, we don't have any money. And uh, we don't know if we could pay you. And uh, I was so wanting to pastor, I said, I tell you what, I'll give you 50 bucks a week if you'll let me come. And uh, Jim Murray shook hands with me and said, that's the best offer we've had, we'll take it. And I'm grateful to God that we've had the opportunity to be here. One thing they did not tell me is that the church was 24 years old and they had already had eight pastors. And uh, 36 months out of that 24 years, they did not have a pastor at all. And so uh, I wondered why they didn't tell me that until I was already here and committed. I didn't even know whether I should unpack uh, my suitcase or not. Uh, the average stay of a pastor was about two years. And uh, I might say with great sadness, all around our country today, all around America, the average stay of, a, of an evangelical preacher is still less than two years. And it makes me wonder why. I think we know in part why. I think back to those days and 35 years ago, Clay said that he, was un, he would be unrecognizable. Uh, and I would too. I actually had hair when I came to Lindsay Chapel. But 35 years of pastoring you guys changed a lot of things. And uh, these boys forgot my water. And if I wasn't real kind, I'd pour that on you, buddy. Uh, but... <laughs> Sam was supposed to do that, but Sam knows me quite well, so halfway down he gave the cup to Levi and told him to deliver it. And he was afraid he'd get something going on there. But I remember standing behind this pulpit 35 years ago, the same pulpit I might add, standing behind this pulpit and being frightened, so very frightened, not because I was standing in front of a congregation I taught a Sunday school class at Stidham that had more people in it than the church here at Lindsay Chapel. So it wasn't a fear of being in front of a crowd. <clears throat> it was a fear, I believe, a godly fear that I might not handle the Word of God in the way that it should be handled. A fear that I may not deliver the word of God in such a manner that it would be honoring and pleasing to God. And I stand here this morning with those same feelings, realizing how important it is and how essential it is for us to stand and proclaim the word of God and let the Holy Spirit uh, break that down to where it is understandable. I thank God for our men. This morning, Brother Justin broke the bread of life out at the lake, preached the word of God without any apology. Chet stood here this morning, supposed to be teaching, and he got up here and preached for 45 minutes, uh, but it was good. As a matter of fact, it blessed my heart. Just before I came in the sanctuary earlier, someone sent me a text. I have no idea where it came from. Apparently, they were live streaming this morning. I was not aware of that. And I got a text that said, would you please... Tell Brother Chet that his message this morning has already made an impact on my life. It has reminded me that I need to love my wife better and I need to love God all the more. That's what happens when you open the book and preach the book. 
And I'm grateful that I've had 35 years to do that. I remember those 35 years ago, there were a handful of believers here who understood that they needed a pastor, they needed a shepherd. I didn't know how to be either one of those. They were that handful of believers that understood that they were going to have to walk beside me and teach me. And I want to tell you, I've praised God many, many times for the men that God put around me that day. There were just a handful of men, but they made a commitment that day because as I preached that particular night and they asked me to be their pastor, I said to them, I do not know how to pastor a church, and I'll have to depend on you men to walk side by side with me and teach me and give me instruction and reproof and correction when it is necessary. But you men are going to have to stand beside me and walk beside me. And for 35 years, God has put men around me that has done that. The names have changed and the faces have changed. But God has continued to put men around me. And I see young men coming up now that will also walk beside me and Pastor Clay and whatever God has in store for this church in the future. I glance out this morning and I see Brother Bob Williams and Miss Dean here. Moved to the city a few years ago. Brother Bob was one of our deacons for a number of years. And as I shared with him earlier, I remember when they first came and he became one of our deacons and how we used to sit in not only business meetings, but sit in each other's homes. And, and he would instruct me because he had been there. He understood what a pastor was and what a blessing for men like Brother Bob. Bob, I thank you. God bless you for being here with us this morning. But God has always put that kind of men around me. They have suffered long with me. And they have been kind to me. They have helped me in places that I needed help. I think about school. They took me through Head Start, pre-K, kindergarten, and we're still on the journey today. And I'm grateful for all of that. I think about oftentimes, early on, I was about to go crazy. You might say, well, you finally got there. Uh, I was about to go crazy trying to grow a church, trying to build a church. And I remember one time the men sat down with me realizing that I was about to work myself to death. And they shared Matthew 16, 18 with me where the Bible says, Upon this rock I will build my church. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And those men that surrounded me said, Brother Tim, God didn't call you to build a church. God called you to be faithful to his word, and he will build his church. And that's what's blessed my life for so long. I don't feel the responsibility to build a church anymore. It's my responsibility to open the word of God and to preach the word of God and trust him that he will build his church. And as he builds his church, it will stand the test of time. I got a call from a young man this morning that's celebrating 10 years as a pastor of a church in Garnett, Kansas. 10 years today. And as I thought back, I remembered a number of years ago, he and his little sister lived up here north of the church in a little house with their grandparents, and we would pick them up on the church van and bring them to church. He grew in the Lord. He gave his life to the Lord, surrendered to the ministry, and is pastoring a church now. I got a call from a guy this morning, uh, and actually our, our church uh, supports his ministry now. He reminded me of standing out on the schoolyard when we were in the second and third grade, and him, uh, we laughed this morning. He, he mocked me when we were in the second and third grade. Uh, our pastor drove by the church, and I waved at him, and somebody said, Who is that? I said, That's Brother Atkinson. And I remember Gary mocked at me, and he goes, Oh, Brother Atkinson, and made fun of me because I went to church. That's the only language I knew. And we laughed together this morning because he got saved, surrendered to the ministry in 1980, and our church supports his ministry even today. God has brought us a long ways. I remember... Those early days, I've said this oftentimes, if you've not lived on Texana Road for 35 years, you wouldn't have any clue what I'm talking about. But 35 years ago, Texana Road was a lot different than it is today. I've always said it was like Dodge City, and, uh, and it really was. Now, I know we've still got our problems and such as that, but it's nothing like it used to be. The men and I would be called out three and four nights every week to the community 
to try to help things and settle things down. It was unbelievable. Our church had come uh, already early on to be known as a church that wanted to make a difference, and so we became a target. I remember the first few weeks we were here, Miss Deb and I, Miss Deb came running into the church, and she said, Tim, you need to get out in the parking lot. There's two families having a fist fight in the parking lot. And uh, a couple of men and I went out. We got everybody separated, stuck them in their cars, sit them down the road. As they were leaving, they were shouting at me. And they said, we're never going to be back. And I said, praise God from whom all blessings flow. <laughs> I, remember, I remember that fist fight. It was quite a fight. I remember when I came to Lindsay, I only had one truck. An old yellow truck. Some of y'all remember that. I was so proud of that truck. I took it and had a brand new paint job put on it. Made some people mad because I preached at them. And so one night during service, they came to the church and they kicked the doors and the fenders in on my brand new painted truck. Hurt my feelings. Those were funny days. I remember we put our first mailbox up on Texana Road in the very next week. Somebody shot holes all in our mailbox. I think they didn't want us here for some reason or another. I, I remember one time, actually, this is kind of crazy, but during church service, somebody stole one of my trucks from the ranch. And uh, we kind of knew, we had a clue who did it, so I uh, got some of the guys from the church, and we began to search. I had Lee Turner with me, and uh, we, I couldn't get the law to help us. They just made a report and said, see you later. I said, we're going after my truck. And so uh, Lee and I found the guy. And we chased him. And it was a wonderful thing. I mean, you should have been with us. And uh, we were chasing the guy. He runs my tree into a big, uh, my truck into a big oak tree, totals my truck out, takes my Winchester out of the truck, and takes off through the woods. It was nighttime. And Lee and I got after him. We were chasing him through the woods. Lee stopped me, and he said, Preacher, wait a minute. I don't think that we're the sharpest knives in the box. He said, the guy obviously has no regard for law or life. He's got your gun, and we're chasing him unarmed <laughs> in the dark woods. Uh, those, were, uh, those were different days. I remember Miss Deb, you know, she hardly ever lets me drive her car. She didn't want me to drive her car. I drove her car to the church one night. It was on a Saturday night. I had a meeting in my office with a fella, and I drove her car to the church. And while I was in my meeting, somebody stole her new Buick. We found it a day or two later, run off in the lake, and some of you are going, are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you. It was kind of wild when we came to Lindsay Chapel. I remember being called to a situation where a man and his wife had been in a knife fight, and uh, I told Miss Deb when I left that evening, I said, now, if I don't call you back, we didn't have cell phones back then, I said, if uh, this man called me, he was hollering over the phone, and, and I knew who he was, and, uh, but immediately the phone went dead. I told Deb, I said, listen, I'm going. If I don't make contact with you in about 30 or 45 minutes, call the neighbor. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. Back then, the law wasn't doing much out here. I said, call the neighbor to come and, and make sure that I'm still upright. And uh, I remember going into that house, and this guy's standing against his uh, couch, and, and uh, he's almost bled out already. And uh, I walked in, he's standing there holding a fireplace poker. His wife's on the other side of the room with a big knife in her hand. She had stabbed him twice. And when I walked in, he just fell over on the couch. It looked like he isn't dead, Steve. So uh, you might say, what did you do? I was scared. That's what I was. She done stabbed him. I didn't figure she had any regard for me either. And so I said, lady, I'm gonna, I want you to give me that knife. And she said, you go to who I preached about don't go in all the time. You and I said, lady, I already got that covered. <laughs> I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. And I said, I'm, I, I was scared. And I said, I'm fixing to take that knife away from you. I said, I was a lot of things before I was a preacher. <laughs> and she got scared and threw me the knife. The guy was all butchered up. And I said, let me take you to the hospital. Lee remembers this. He goes, I can't go to the hospital. I've got some legal issues, and I can't go to the hospital. He looked at me. I got him to wake up by then. He said, you're going to have to patch me up the best you can. Praise God, I had my doctrine bag <laughs> with me. I couldn't find anything to disinfect those knife wounds. And he was stabbed rather bad, and I couldn't find anything in the house to doctor those wounds with, except I found a bottle of Clorox. <laughs> How many of y'all have been doctored up with a bottle of Clorox? 
He said, what are you going to pour on me? I said, that's all I can find besides water. And so I, I doctored him up with that Clorox. Poured that Clorox on there. You talk about a man screaming like a woman. He was <laughs> but he got all right. I, I, could go, I could go on and on. Some of you are going, are you kidding me? I've come home from situations and brought knives and guns and such as that. We used to have a big collection of knives and guns that we took away from people. Miss Deb kept them in our utility room for a long time. I could go on. I remember one time I took a guy visited with me. I'm going to preach to you in a minute. We're going to be for, here for a while. So. I, I, I don't normally take people out visiting with me because it gets kind of dangerous sometimes, but I took a guy with me one night. I got called out in the middle of the night, and in my heart I felt like it was a setup. We disrupted the drug traffic on, te on Texana Road when we came here, and it made a lot of people mad. And uh, so I got called out one night. I felt like it was a, it was a setup, and uh, sure enough, had a, a guy that just physically attacked me uh, but that, that's not where I'm going. Um, I got ready to go on that call, and I called a fella down the road to go with me. The authorities had asked me not to go out by myself at night because it was dangerous. And uh, so I called a fella to go with me, and he was a guy that got saved at this church, but he didn't come to church anymore. Never came to church. So I called him, asked him to go with me, and uh, it was a very eventful night, and uh, we were just glad to get home in a, in a one piece and on the way home he said preacher he said I really do appreciate you calling me and let me go with you but but he said why do you call me and I said well you got saved a few years ago didn't you and he said yeah and I said but you never come to church right and he goes well yeah and I said why would I want to risk the life of one of my faithful men I said, if something happens to you, we ain't lost anything. <laughs> but you know what? I still call him. Matter of fact, I called him last night. Still dragging him around. Yeah, it was, um, it was strange days back then. And once again, I could tell you stories. I had the authorities call me to a house one night where a, a guy was holed up. This has happened several times. I took one of my churchmen with me. He said, what do you want me to do? I said, I have no clue what I'm going to do, but just stay with me. And we got in this house. This man was a, he was a Vietnam vet. I love the guy. They were trying to get him out of his house, and he wouldn't come out. So I went in. The sheriff allowed me to go in. I went in. I had this guy right behind me. Um, his name was Ben. I had Ben with me, and I knew the layout of the house. And when I walked in, there was, you got to understand, he was a vet. And he had suffered what we call today PTSD is something different back then. And as I walked in the house, it was dark, no light. But there was a, a light on the oven that was putting out a little bit of light, like a night light. And um, he had rifles leaned up at every window. And um, he had knocked all the doors off their hinges. And I began to shout at him and holler at his name. And in a moment, he stepped out in the hall. I could see... My eyes had got adjusted by then. He come out, and he was carrying a pistol. And uh, I said, listen, I'm here to help you. And um, guys, he didn't like me very much, but I want to tell you, he had respect for this church. He had respect. And I remember him walking down the hall and meeting me, and we sat down at a little dining room table. The, uh, the guy from the church was with us as well. And as we sat there, police were all surrounded, and lights were flashing, and he said, um, he said, you know, they think I'm crazy. And under my breath, I said, me too. <laughs> but then I thought, he probably thought I was crazy for coming in. And I said, we want to help you, get you some help. He said, they think I'm, they think I'm going to take my own life. He said, if I wanted to take my life, I could do it. And he reached and got a cigarette lighter, and the curtains on the window were made out of a burlap type material. He took his cigarette lighter and just set the curtains on fire. We're sitting right there. He set the curtains on fire. <laughs> the guy that was with me looks at me like, what do we do now? <laughs> well, he had his pistol right there in his hand, and I said, don't do anything. Don't do anything. Don't even move. 
in a minute, the curtain was blazing. In a minute, he reached up and jerks the curtains down, stomps them out. I remember we took that man out that night and got him some help. Things have, we've had a really exciting time. I've always said I was going to write a book. But then probably most people wouldn't believe it. I'd have to change all the names to protect the ignorant. <clears throat> but we've had a good time for 35 years, and God is blessed. God has been so good to us. There's a real good possibility I won't live 35 more. But I thank God. I thank God for the opportunity that he has given me to pastor this church and for the men and women that he has put around me to teach me, to help me, to be such a blessing to me. I want to take you to, I guess, one of my favorite scriptures, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to stand with me, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> Some of you may be wondering why I said I don't normally take people out to visit with me. When I'm out knocking on doors, I always tell people you have to, you have to be um, focused. And you can't let things bother you. You can't react when you're out. Right, Brother Lee? I mean, you know that. You've been with me a lot. I think about the years that Clyde and Twyla have been with us, and we've been places that we could not write about even if we wanted to. But um, I remember one time, and I'm going to read this scripture to you. I'll preach real fast this morning. I remember one time I had a young man here, and he felt like he was called to ministry, and so I dragged him around with me knocking on doors. But I'd always told him, do not react. No matter what happens, do not react. He got that down real good. So we went to a house one evening to make a visit. And um, the lady opened the door let us in. She had two or three kids. And the house was an absolute mess. So uh, if y'all think I might come over, you might want to clean the house a little bit. Um, but uh, we went in, and there was no place to sit. It was just a mess. And uh, so uh, I've learned, so I just went over to the couch and just pushed the clothes over, all the clothes and stuff that was laying there, pushed them over. And, and uh, the young man and I, I sat here, and he sat in a chair over here, and we began to visit with the lady and share Christ with her. And those kids were running around, and they were yelling at each other and screaming at each other, and we were trying to share the gospel over all of that. And um, in a little bit, one of the kids grabbed a handful of clothes and threw them at his sibling. And the sibling grabbed a handful of clothes and threw them back. And, and in the midst of all that, this young man that was with me, he had black horn rim glasses and they had broke. And so he had put a paper clip through this side to hold the, the, his earpiece on. And, and these kids were throwing clothes and in a moment, a part of this lady's undergarments hung on his glasses. <laughs> he never batted eye. He just sat there. I was so embarrassed. She was totally embarrassed. It kind of broke the, you know, it kind of broke the rhythm of sharing the gospel. But he just sat there with her underwear hanging on his head. And I finally looked at him and said, if it's all the same to you, if you'll take that lady's drawers off the side of your head, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> I'm going to write a book. <laughs> One of my favorite scriptures in all the Bible the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What I see when I read that is that if a man, a woman, boy, or girl, if a person accepts Christ as the Lord and Savior of their life, there is a difference. And I would simply entitle the message this morning, There is a difference that makes a difference. 
there is a difference that makes a difference. That's what my prayer for this church has always been. That we would be so different from this world that we could make a difference in this world. But unless we are different, we will make no difference. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful and we love you. Thank you for the joy of being a Christian. Thank you, Lord, for a few minutes to just reminisce and look forward, Lord, to this evening when we can laugh together and cry together as we look back over all these years. God, my goal today is the same as it was 35 years ago, that we might exalt Jesus Christ, that we might proclaim this word and never apologize. And that through all that, that people may come to know you as their Lord and Savior. And we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You can be seated. I do want to take some liberties, and I'm going to hold you a little longer than normal. But I believe that it's very, very important for us to understand that there is a difference that makes a difference. There's a difference that every born-again child of God should have experienced the very day that you gave your life to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and that difference continues to manifest itself in our daily walk. Not now, not just tomorrow, but as long as we live, that distance between us and the world should become further and further. The difference between you and the world should be greater and greater every day of our lives. God is interested in the purity of his church. He wants us to be holy. Did you know that three times in Leviticus and then also the apostle Peter said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. God wants the purity of the church to stand out. I believe with all my heart that the church is the apple of God's eye. He died for the church. Ephesians 5.25 said that he gave himself for the church. So we know that the growth and well-being of the church, the purity of the church is God's business. The purity of the church is what God desires so much. And then we ask the question, what is the church? And the answer, of course, is you. The answer is the people. We are the church. If if there was no one in this building at all, we might still call it a church building, but that's all it would be without people. And so God is interested in the purity of the church, but that really comes down to your personal purity, to your personal righteousness, not of yourself, but of God. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. It's nothing of ourselves. God wants the church to look that way. So we know that winning people to Christ and discipling them and teaching them to live in a Christ-like manner is the goal of our church. I've always believed that one church could make a difference. I've always believed that one person can make a difference. And especially in our culture today, the, the old devil has almost made us to believe that we need to stay out of the issues of the world. We need to stay out of things out there and just kind of huddle up here as a body, and that's not true. We're to come together and we're to worship together and we're to sing the praises of God together, but then the Bible says that we are to go out into the world, not be of the world, but be in the world and be so different that we can make a difference in this world. And therefore, your personal purity is important. It grieves my heart when I realize that sometimes as believers, we score points for the wrong team. You might say, what do you mean by that? We score points for the wrong team. I heard, I didn't see it, but many years ago, uh, a basketball game was going on in and uh, it was a high school ball game, and that was during the days that when they tied the ball up, they had a jump ball. I don't know, I think some of the rules have changed, but it was right down to the end of the game, and everybody was excited, and it was a tie ball game, and they had a jump ball. And when the two guys jumped, one of them tipped the ball, and this young guy grabs the ball and takes off dribbling toward the goal. 
I'm sure that he couldn't understand in the moment while no one was guarding him. I'm sure that in the moment he didn't think why his teammates were yelling at him and telling him to stop. Maybe he thought that they didn't want him to get the glory. But he dribbled to the other end and shot the goal, made the basket, but he made the score for the other team. Did you know that many Christians are doing that today? We're scoring points for the devil. We're scoring points for the wrong team. When we say that we are children of God, when we claim to be Christians, and I, I want you young people, I praise God for all these young people this morning, but I want you young people to listen especially to what I'm saying. Do not go out into this world and score points for the wrong team. If you say you're a child of God and you say you're a member of this church, you need to represent God and you need to represent this church. It is important and stop scoring points for the enemy. But that's what's going on in many, many churches today. I've always believed that one church could make a difference in a, on a large scale if you want to use that term. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul describes what I would call some unsavory, sinful characters. But then Paul said, But such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He said, that's what you were, but now you are different. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We're those that have been called out of darkness into the marvelous light of Christ. And obviously, we should be different. When I think about light, I think about a, uh, another situation that happened not long after I came. Our sanctuary was totally different back then. We had dark paneling everywhere. The ceiling was dark, and it was just kind of dark in our sanctuary. And one Sunday morning, I was preaching, and uh, it was storming outside, and I was preaching up a storm inside, and all of the lights went out. And it kind of shocked everybody. And I could hear a little bit of murmuring because you literally couldn't see anything. Someone opened a couple of the outside doors so we could get a little light. And within a couple of minutes, a couple of my men, I don't know where they went to get them, maybe to their vehicles, and these men, because I told everybody to be still, they came up behind the pulpit and they stood on either side of me with flashlights so I could continue to read the Word of God and preach the Word of God. Guys, that's the way it ought to be. Listen, we were, but now we are called to shed the marvelous light of Christ out in this world. There is a difference that makes a difference. It's always been my personal goal and the goal for this church that if everything else fails, if everything else fails, that we could exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. There used to be an old song that went something like this, In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, just give me Jesus. And if we do nothing else, that we might exalt the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, there is a difference that makes a difference. When we exalt Christ, that's different nowadays. Not everyone that stands behind the pulpit exalts the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter and John in Acts chapter 4 were exalting Christ. They were preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. They were threatened by the religious leaders of the day. We've been there as a church. We've been threatened by various, uh, I guess you could say, organizations and things like that. We've been threatened but we've continued to preach the Word of God. When Peter and John were dragged in, the Bible says that they were threatened, but they left that place saying, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. A few chapters later, they were brought in again, and this time they weren't just threatened for exalting Christ. The Bible says that they beat them, that they restrained them, and they gave them a good beating, if you will. 
And the Bible says that when they let them go, that Peter and John said, we count it an honor that we have been worthy. We rejoice that we've been worthy of suffering for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, exalting Christ makes a difference. Preaching the gospel clearly and simply makes a difference. But it is different. We can... Look around our country today and there are many preachers that are standing behind pulpits like this today and they are not proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're trying to please the crowd. They're trying to go along with the world. You see, there's a difference. My prayer has always been that whoever stands behind this pulpit preaches the truth. As a matter of fact, I, I, my mind went back to a time just now where uh, I was asked if uh, uh, a fella in the community had died and our building was the largest building in the community and they wanted to have a funeral at our church. And I said, well, who's going to do the funeral? And they told me. And when they told me who was going to do the funeral, he is a man that does not preach the, the Bible as it is given to us. And so um, I was very reluctant, but I wanted to be sensitive to this family and so I said, I'll need to talk to him. And he and I sit down together and I said, now I'm going to be sitting right here on the front. And if you vary, and I gave him the direction I knew that he goes. I said, if you vary from the word of God, I will stop you. And the service will be over. Now some of you are saying, isn't that a little bit arrogant? Isn't that a little bit over the top? I believe not. I believe that God is so concerned with the purity of the church that who stands behind that pulpit and those men that have been standing up here and teaching our Sunday school over the last year, you all know that God expects of you and I expect of you that you will open the word of God and preach and teach the word of God without apology, without fear. That is different in our day. But it's the only thing that will make a difference in our day. There is a difference that makes a difference. When I think about those things that make a difference, refusing to compromise on Bible truth that has been dragged into our political arena. We've had people leave our church through the years because they felt like I was too political. I've never felt that way myself. I I just feel like, and I've said it to you many times, that the political uh, community, if you will, they have taken things out of the Word of God that are biblical, dragged them into the political arena, and they've done that to try to divide the church of God, and they've done a pretty good job of dividing because we're not discerning enough to know that some things that the world calls political were way, way before that biblical, but yet we're afraid to stand on those issues. I saw something the other day that was somewhat appalling to me, and again, I don't want to, I don't want to be terribly offensive to anyone this morning, but I was listening to a, um, some kind of a Senate hearing on television, and um, they had this person that our president had, had uh, uh, picked to be a, a director or something of health and human source, something like that. And um, Senator Rand Paul was asking that person questions. Now, I said, I don't want to be offensive to you, uh, nor anybody listening out there, but this person was a biological man who has transgendered to a woman. Now, it was on national news. This is no secret. It's on national news. And the senator was addressing him as a her because that's what he said he wanted to be. Now, guys, let me just say this to you. It is a biblical compromise. I know this is a hot issue, but just stay with me. It is a biblical compromise when we are so afraid that we're going to use the wrong pronoun. When we address a biological man as a woman, we are compromising the word of God. And when we address a biological woman 
as if she were a man, we are compromising the word of God. Listen, you might say, well, but there's laws now. Let me say this. It is better to obey God. It is better to fear God than to fear man. Now, I don't want to be mean and obnoxious or arrogant or anything like that. But since God wasn't confused about those issues, why has the church become literally silent on those issues? We must not compromise the word of God. You might say, well, what would you have done? I would have addressed that person for what she, he was biologically. You might say, well, they would have kicked you out of the hearings. So be it. So be it. If we're going to make a difference, we have to decide right now that there's some places where we're not going to be welcome. There's some places we're not going to be asked to speak. Recently, I did a funeral. And in the obituary, it referred to a particular woman and her wife. I looked at the obituary and I'm going, I know some of you are going, why don't you just read it the way they gave it to you? And I went to Miss Deb and I said, Deb, I can't do that. Oh, I'm going to cause a fuss. I said, I can't do that. How many of you guys have ever been struck by lightning? <laughs> you know what I believe? I believe that if I look at something like that and it is in direct opposition to the word of God and I were to do that in the house of God, listen, it wouldn't surprise me if lightning struck me. Listen, you might say, well, what did you do? I didn't read it. I didn't do it. You might say, well, that was disrespectful. Listen, I, I'd, I'd rather have the approval of God. I'd rather have the approval of God than the applause of men. And, and just maybe, just maybe those people involved realizing that I was not going to read their lies, maybe somehow the Holy Spirit might work through that. Folks, listen, there's a difference that makes a difference. And God has called this church to be different. But unless you bring that down to your own personal life, it will not make a difference. It's your purity. It's your steadfastness. It's your willingness to stand when everyone else is folding. That's what makes a difference, and that's what makes this church and I praise God for it did you know that when I think about things that truly exalt the Lord I think about standing up and even though we may be criticized I forgot to mention some of you are aware that a few years ago I was invited to speak at a function and it was over the Ten Commandments how many of y'all know the Ten Commandments are still relevant to our lives today all scripture it's still relevant today but our world says no I, I was invited to speak and and um, there were maybe a couple other preachers there there was one of our senators was there and some local authorities and I don't know why they decided to pick on me but that was on a Saturday and on the next Sunday morning my phone began to ring and and uh, back then people actually got newspapers and and uh, there was this story on the front page of the newspaper where um, I, had, I had used hate speech. And um, so for about the next two years, um, I, I, I got investigated by the OSBI and the FBI, and they just aggravated me good. But you know what? We never folded. We never changed. Because I didn't say something from myself. I only only alluded to the word of God you see God is our protector God will protect will take care of us I remember that last conversation I had with an officer with the FBI he he said this to me he said now uh, preacher I'm gonna turn this recording off and I said okay that'll be fine he turned it off and then he said this to me he said I am a born-again Christian he stopped for a moment and he said, keep it up. Keep it up. 
Keep standing on the truth of the Word of God. You see, when we are consistent, that's different. When we're consistent, that's different. I've never made light of the COVID issue. It's been a very serious issue. It's affected thousands of people. It's affected more than that through deceit and lies. But it has affected many people. Did you know that there was this talk going around when COVID first came, and there's a few families in our church now that came during that time. It was this. Lindsay Chapel will be having church. Lindsay Chapel will be having church. You might say, well, in that in defiance? No, it's not in defiance. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. And he says, especially in this day. Especially in this day. We need to be consistent. We need to stay focused even when we're under attack. And we do not need to be afraid of offending. I know many preachers that tiptoe behind the pulpit because they're afraid they're going to offend somebody. Some few years ago, a fellow visited our church, and as he left, he, he made it known to me that he was a pastor. And uh, he said this to me. He said, how long have you been here? And at that time, I said, probably 30 years. I don't know. And he backed up from me, and he said, well, I knew that you, were, you had either just started or you'd been here a long time. He said, if I preached at my church what you preached this morning, they would fire me. And I looked at him with compassion and I said, chicken. Are y'all with me? Listen, I'd rather be walking down the road with nothing but the clothes on my back than to have to compromise the Word of God to, pre to please a bunch of church members that are not really saved. There is a difference that makes a difference. I remember one time I made a comment from behind this pulpit. It was during an election, just after an election cycle, and I made a statement in reference to one of our former presidents. Now, some of you are going to maybe draw up a little when I say this. But I said that by his own admission, he was a pervert and a liar. By his own admission. Because just that week he had gone on news and said, I have misled the American people. You know what misled means if you're a politician? That means you lied. And he said, I did have an inappropriate sexual encounter. You know what that means if you're not a politician? That means that you jumped in bed with somebody you wasn't supposed to. And I remember we had a family that left our church because of that. You might say, well, but that's political. No, it's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. And when we become as a church afraid to stand and tell the truth we will make no difference in this world. There is a difference that makes a difference. Difference does not mean that we're necessarily odd or strange, but it does mean that we distinguish ourselves in such a way as to be identified as a child of God. That's a difference that makes a difference. Did you know that children of God should abstain from drugs and alcohol? Now, I know it's tough. I know, I know. But did you know the Bible says wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and he that is deceived thereby is a fool. Are y'all following me? Now, I, I hadn't looked in your icebox. I have looked through your window, but I hadn't looked in your icebox. Uh, so I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. And you can cipher that out any way you want to. But that's not becoming of a child of God, especially in our world today. 
that's a difference that will make a difference. The guy down at the local store don't like for Pastor Clay and I to be there on weekends because he said it does knocks a hole in his beer sales if we hang around the store. I had a guy a while back, I was sitting over there eating a sandwich, this guy walks up to the counter and he had a big old box of beer, it's the size of a suitcase. There must have been 25 bottles of beer in that thing or whatever, cans, whatever. He set it on the counter and he turned around and saw me. <laughs> so he walked over to me and he goes, I use that to cook with. And I said, well, you must be cooking for the U.S. Army this weekend. <laughs> now, I know some of you are going, why can't you just be quiet? I didn't start it. He did. I wasn't going to say anything to him. I was going to follow him outside and go, nee, 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 nee. <laughs> But it takes a difference to make a difference. Did you know that a child of God should dress biblically and not worldly? And I know most of you young people at that point shut me out, and that's fine. But I want to tell you, it breaks my heart. And I want you young people to look up here for a minute. It breaks my heart to see you out in the world dressed exactly like the world where it would be totally impossible for anybody to look at you and, and distinguish that you were a child of God. That's heartbreaking. As your pastor, it's heartbreaking. It breaks my heart for you, not just you young people, but especially to somehow believe that God's word is not true in that area when he says we should dress in modest apparel. And that means all the time. I mean, if you must go to the lake, can you abandon God's word at that point and strip off naked and go to the lake and please God? And the answer is no. You might say, preacher, you, you're living in a different world. I mean, you are living in a different world. We are in 2021. I'm well aware of where we are. As a matter of fact, I might be more aware of where we are than some of you think. The old devil has got you scoring points for the other team. You young people, every time you walk out in the public dressed like the world, you're scoring points for the other team. How sad that is. It takes a difference to make a difference. Some of your social media activity gives no indication that you're a child of God. No difference whatsoever. Your friends are worldly friends. If you were to let me look at your phone and go through your friend list one at a time and I were to ask them, there's very few of them would have any idea that you were even a child of God because of your conduct, your apparel, and your talk. It's hard to share the gospel with somebody you just fornicated with. Some of you are going, Preacher, why don't you just tell us some more of them funny stories? Because that doesn't make any difference. It takes a difference to make a difference. Our vocabulary ought to be different if we're saved. Where we go and who we go with makes a difference. I've seen many people sacrifice their testimony on the ball field. Literally sacrifice their Christian testimony on the ball field. I've seen young men and young women sacrifice their testimony because they just thought they had to, had to be a cowboy. Some of you are going, I can't believe that coming out of your mouth. Listen, I've seen young people sacrifice their testimony, score points for the other team because they were chasing that fantasy and looking just like the world. 
I've seen young people that were committed to Christ go off to college and sacrifice their testimony for some education. You might say, are you against education? No, I'm not. I wish I had a little more of it. But if I have to sacrifice my Christian testimony to get an education, I'll take my testimony and leave the education behind. God is able to take care of you whether or not you have a degree hanging on your wall. And so if you cannot accomplish that without sacrificing your testimony, at least make a difference in that area. Some of you know who a man named Eric Liddell or Eric Little is. Way back in the 20s, he was an Olympian. And in most circles, if you use that name, everybody knows who you're talking about. Do you know why we know his name? Because he made a stand. He was different. He wouldn't run in an Olympic event because it fell on a Sunday. Some of you might say, are you kidding me? A guy trained for four years and refused to run because it was on a Sunday? That's why I'm telling this story right now, and that's why you recognize the name. He was different. And to this day, he is making a difference. The Bible says not to forsake our coming together. To many people, you have given up your testimony. You make no difference because being in the house of God has become optional to you. Being in the house of God has become optional. I do not expect anybody to pattern anything after me, and I mean that. It would be a rather boring world if everybody tried to be just like me or just like you. Did you know that in 35 years, now, early on, I would go preach other places because I felt so obligated when people asked me to go. God, God took that away, and I praise God for it. He took away that, that feeling of obligation so I could be here and pastor this church. But I'd go all over the country preaching, and, and, um, but I seldom, I don't remember ever planning a meeting where I had to be gone on a Sunday. You might say, well, you were going to be in church there. But that's not the same as being in my church. Are y'all following me? Not the same. You, in 35 years, I have missed one Sunday because of illness. And I came that morning. But I got sick and ended up in the hospital all day that day. Now, some of you are saying, well, do you ever get sick? I mean, do you ever get sick on a Sunday? I wake up a lot of Sunday mornings when I don't feel good. As a matter of fact, a lot of Sunday mornings I've had maybe two hours of sleep the night before. But I just believe it's important, not just for the shepherd, but for the sheep. To be in the house of God, you know what? That makes a difference. Did you know that your neighbors know whether you're in church this morning or not? Mike, did you know that? You know, some of your neighbors looked out the window this morning and goes, there goes Mike. He's got to be in church on Sunday. Maybe poke a little fun at you. You know what? That makes a difference. They might not even like you, but they'll have respect for you one day down the road. Your neighbors know how committed you are to the house of God. Did you know that that's a difference that makes a difference? It's a difference that makes a difference. I remember one time I had to have surgery, and they, was, they told me I'd heal up real quick. But the doctor made a little mistake. And so I was miserable for a few days. And I remember one Sunday morning, I couldn't, I couldn't stand up. And so Pastor Clay preached for me that morning. I called one of my men. I said, listen, at about 15 till 11, I want you to come and get me and, and help me get in the truck and bring me to church. And I'll sit back in the back in a chair. Now, I know some of you are going, that's ridiculous, preacher. And I don't believe that God would have judged me had I stayed home. I, I, I didn't, I was... I, did, I couldn't stand up. But I remember the guy helping me in the church, and I got to sit down back there in the back. Pastor Clay got up and preached. We had a guy got saved that morning. I got, to, I got to witness that. Guys, listen. There's a difference that makes a difference. There's a difference. 
And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about those of you that there should be no question that you're going to be here when the doors are open. I shouldn't have to look around and worry and wonder, well, is so-and-so here, is so-and-so there? Now, I do that. I do that not so that we can fill the pews because it, it, it hurts, it breaks my heart when people are not faithful to a God who laid down his life for you. It takes a difference to make a difference. Did you know that a difference is that the world will not want to be close to you? I look at Christians, so-called Christians, and they're just in love with the world, and the world's in love with them. I mean, literally, the, the world loves them. Do you know that's a major problem? Did you know that if you're really living for Christ, you are not going to have close friends in this world, and you might as well get used to it. You might as well get used to it. Because the Bible says as the world hated Christ, the world hates us. He's given us a message, and we go share the message, and when we share the message, the world hates us. So if you have very, very, very close worldly friends and you're not sharing the gospel with them, you're not making a difference. If we are different, we will make a difference. You know, I was blessed just yesterday, and I'm getting ready to close here. I stopped by the hospital to see Brother Barry. And while I was there, a couple of young men came in. I know Brady was there and saw this. A couple of young men came in that I see at our local feed store. They work there. And uh, I've, I've always given them tracks and trying to witness to them and such as that. And, and I have a good time with the guys, but that's my only contact is just there. And these young men came in and they went in and they spoke to us and we visited for just a moment. They went on and a little bit. They come back out and they said, would you come in and pray for our grandmother? Now, guys, let me tell you this. There's a lot of people that buy feed at that feed store. Are y'all following me along? And I know that they know that I'm a pastor because I've handed them our church tracts and I've witnessed to them and, and I oftentimes scold them about their sin. But it was a blessing to me yesterday for them to come back and ask me to pray for their grandmother. Give me an opportunity to witness to her and to them. You must say, so where are you going with that story? I don't believe that the average person that had they had run into that day, I don't think that they would have gone to just anybody and ask you might say well does that make you special no it makes me nothing but it makes my heavenly father everything there is a difference that makes a difference if we're going to win people to Christ we have to be different if we're going to maintain the purity of this church we have to be different there was a lot of men in Scripture that made a difference, and we'll talk about them later. I referred to a song earlier. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, just give me Jesus. And when I come to die, and when I come to die, when I come to die, just give me Jesus. Let's all stand together. Miss Christian, if you'll make your way to the piano, please. I know this has not been such an evangelistic message. But it's blessed my heart to get to preach to you. 
And to see on your faces that you truly love Jesus Christ. What a blessing. To see that you truly love Jesus Christ. If you're not saved today, there'll never be a better time than right now. I know what time it is. I've gone a little longer than normal this morning. But Jesus will make a difference in your life. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one's looking around. If you need Jesus today, would you come? I'll meet you right here. We have other people that can meet you as Miss Kristen plays. Are you lost without him today? The only way you'll ever make a difference is if you allow him to make that difference in your life. You can't make a difference in this world if you're looking like the world. You can't make a difference in this world if you're courting the world. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. New is different. It's the difference that will make a difference. If you need to get saved today, would you walk down this aisle? We'll meet you right here. Just walk down this aisle right now with heads bowed and eyes closed. If you'd say to me, Pastor Tim, I'm not sure that I'm a child of God. You might even be honest and say, I know that I'm not a child of God. But if you're not sure, I'll not embarrass you, but I'd love to be able to pray for you this week. If you're not sure that you're a child of God, would you raise your hand just so I could pray for you? I don't know who you are. If you'll just lift your hand, preacher, pray for me. I'm not certain. But I'd like to know for sure that when I die, that I could enter into heaven by the grace of God. If you need to come, come. Just as I am. Listen, you can come just as you are, but you cannot leave like you came. You get saved today, you're going to be different. You're going to be different. She's going to play one more verse. If you don't come, you're going to close the service. Would you? Would you come? Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Brother Pat Skaggs, would you make your way to the pulpit, please? We look so forward to seeing you this evening at 6. Uh, Pastor Clay handed me an order of service while ago, and there are several preachers going to be here. But I noticed he didn't leave any room for me to say anything. I asked Miss Deb this morning, I said, Miss Deb, do you remember 35 years ago this morning? She says, No. Dismisses. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to participate in the salvation that you died on the cross for us, Lord. Help us to, to always be mindful of the, the sacrifice that you paid for us, Lord, and to always to be able to, to forgive and able to, to love others, Lord, that you call us to love. Lord, I, I lift up the ones that, that need your healing hand. I continually pray for Brother Barry, Lord, that you Continue to do a work in his life, Lord, and, and on his life, Lord, that you continue to heal him and bring him back to us whole, Lord. Lord, I pray for the others that are in our church that, are, that need your healing hand, need your peace and your comfort, Lord, that you that you put your hand upon them and that your will be done above all, Lord. And I pray for us as we go out into the world that you always put your name on our lips, Lord, always be quick to give an answer for the hope that resides within us, Lord, to tell others about your love and the desire that we have to serve you in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen.